Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Welcome to The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and today we have Navy SEAL and MMA pro fighter, Mm -hmm. Bobby Winther. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Bobby, they tell me that your your fighting name is The Ghost. (laughs) Can you explain a little bit about that before we get into all your background and everything? Absolutely. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I wish the story was cooler than it it actually is, but I have a uh, a tattoo on my arm, uh, and the character is from a video game called The Ghost of Tsushima, which is like, he's a samurai... Uh, that pretty much has to abandon this or has to go against the samurai code in order to beat the Mongols that had like invaded his territory. So he can't, he has to kind of like sneak behind the scenes a little bit to, to defeat the enemy rather than just like fight him like outright. And he kind of had like a lot of like rift between the actual samurai that he was with and then just kind of like the people he was rebelling against too. So uh, I kind of liked the reason why I picked that as a as a nickname for me is like a warrior that you you're gonna have to do what it takes to win sometimes and about like seals were all about being sneaky and being behind the scenes so uh, um that's kind of I kind of thought it fit really well in that and also I thought the game was pretty cool too (laughs) yeah well I guess there's some some themes there about resilience and adaptability which is something that we talk a lot about here at NSW is the ability for operators to naturally adapt in their environment, overcome obstacles, and and keep moving despite challenges. And you probably see that a lot in just training for MMA, right? Oh, all the time, yeah. Like, um, for mixed martial arts, it's the most fundamental form of warfare, I like to explain. It's like, 1v1, no weapons, just our hands, just, just whatever rule set we're going in right there and you're constantly met with different skills that pose different problems to you so like uh if someone's really good at defending wrestling and that's your best skill well you got to figure out a, a way to make that work for you inside the fight i always say it's the most fundamental form because as you get to like actual warfare within like the platoons you have teams you have weapons now and you have a lot more assets which is a lot more things to control um but the idea and the concept of warfare still remains the same they may have something that deters you from moving to a specific area so you have to answer that in a different way whether that be with like uh aircraft whether that be with a different fire team so that's kind of the as far as the resilience and adaptability it's constantly going and i feel like mma is such a great way to practice that daily Your role here at Naval Special Warfare is a combatives instructor at our Advanced Training Command, which is attached to the center here. So you're applying lessons that you learn in MMA to the curriculum? Correct, yeah. So I've been doing the sport for quite some time now, and I've I started jujitsu about like 12 years ago, and then slowly picked up wrestling and striking, and then full on mixed martial arts, uh, like competition wise, about three years ago. And as I, when I got to the command, I since I was had a pretty extensive knowledge in the sport aspect of it, and I didn't I didn't have any real world experience for the tactical side of things, so. Uh, the shop I was with act, fortunately had a lot of guys who had a lot of hands-on experience within Iraq and Afghanistan and we both just kind of all of us kind of put our minds together and saw, like just kind of threw things at the wall to see what stuck like okay and here was the tactical situation how would we use combatives to deal with it cool I would use this technique that technique that technique and then they can be like well that doesn't make sense because of the team-based environment or because we may be uh, putting our buddies into a bad position so now it kind of made us like work and adapt the the combatives to whatever that tactical situation was in a um, tactical situation where you're doing effectively urban combat you're in close quarters Mm -hmm. it's room to room Um, we have seen plenty of examples in the past where seals have had to come into direct contact uh, with the enemy uh, sometimes closer than pistol range right oh yeah like in your face kind of close Mm -hmm. and had to actually lay hands on the enemy so this is where your training comes in as a combatives instructor is what happens 
when you get face to face with the enemy. Absolutely. Part of my job is just putting that, like when you do get face to face with with the enemy, is for it to almost be like autopilot, like to be that instinct reaction, like making sure you're doing the fundamentals, fundamentals of fighting instinctually that keep you and your teammates safe. The more you practice it, the more it becomes an instinct, and then you can start actually thinking while you're doing the thing, rather than being so overwhelmed when that that problem happens and then being like, oh gosh, what do I do? What do I do? No, you already know what you do. Then now we can think, okay, here's the situation being presented to me. Let me use X, Y, and Z tactics to finish the job or subdue the suspect. Let's talk a little bit about MMA, right? So you have a professional career. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is your record right now? Currently, it's 1-0. and Hopefully, by the time this podcast comes out, it's going to be 2-0. and I fight this Friday. Wow, that's awesome. And it's a cage match? Pretty much the easiest way is like whatever you see on UFC, uh, like on the TV, that type of cage is what I'll be fighting in. I see. So w- when we talk about the definition of mixed martial arts, how does that translate into SEAL training as well? A lot, a lot of guys will ask, hey, it... What what kind of fighting styles do they do they study? Uh, do seals use? So primarily now we we use a primarily he- grappling heavy system. So what that means is a lot of for if you watch MMA there'll be a lot of like striking in the takedowns and there is that that striking striking meaning like boxing or kickboxing. Um, there'll be that to bridge the gap into the grappling because we have weapons uh, generally that like long distance area is generally controlled with a weapon so we don't see as much striking not that we don't see any Uh, we definitely have times where we throw strikes but most of what we teach combatives is now a grappling heavy system so that way that means like wrestling wall grappling Uh, that's why mma is such a great uh a great tool to use for our operators is because they have a uh, a vertical surface behind them which no other sports have that that's a pro- that's a relatively new newer martial art and a new problem set for martial artists to deal with so and for us because uh the most likely scenario we'd get into that would be in a enclosed area like a room the walls are everywhere so we need to be able to adapt to that kind of to answer your question a grappling heavy approach with aspects of striking within the grappling there. Okay. So we're talking something that might resemble Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Krav Maga, things like that? Yeah, aspects of these can all be the what's considered mixed martial arts. So I, I think for us is like uh, American-style wrestling, uh, Jiu-Jitsu, and then some basic boxing and stuff. We, we don't, as far as like within the actual operators like arsenal of things we want to teach them we don't teach them a ton of like Mm -hmm. kickboxing kicks we may maybe teach one like push kick but it's either that elbows punches and then knees up up and close those are like the only striking applications we really use from like the muay thai and the kickboxing Mm -hmm. arts yeah sounds like some elements of Muay Thai. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, sure. there's a lot in there for but sure. But that's that's short range, right? Oh yeah, really short range, and that's you why you get pinned I, up against a wall, or your guy is pinned up against a wall. If you're that close, then exactly, yeah. It's like if if we're that close, I need to make it not just a grab. And this is why mixed martial arts is such a cool sport and unique in that in that sense is that you can strike within the clinch, you can strike on the ground, which you can't in wrestling. So it's like you get to see like oh this is how you use these short range weapons this is how you get to like employ these things and when when we're teaching down at the base we use all those weapons but we we also recognize that we have weapons of our own that we can use or can employ so figuring out hey what what is the range of each weapon that i'm using on my body and then of my like actual tools that i have too so it's like a John Wick movie. It's actually the best way to think about it. I think it's. I think John Wick crushes it. Obviously, you know, John Wick is like a little over the top. But I wish we could all get there. That'd be awesome if we could all be like John Wick. That would be so sick. <laughs> <laughs> how How did all this begin for you? How did you How did you become interested in in being a Navy SEAL? 
So uh, I got interested. So my brother uh, joined the Marine Corps, and he he joined when he was 17. And even way before he joined, I kind of always felt like drawn to the military. I, and I don't quite understand why. I just kind of was like, I I like it. I think I think that's a respectable thing. So it's a calling. Yeah, exactly. So I I I kind of like always had that inkling that that's the route I wanted to go. I just didn't know how I was going to get there. So my brother joined, and then uh, I was always interested in, like, the medical side of things. Like, I always thought it was cool to be, like, on the op, and then, like, if someone went down, they were like, hey, we need you. And I was like, that guy, like, the medic. So I thought, okay, my brother's a Marine. I want to be – I'd like to be a Marine, but I want to do the medic thing. So you can only be a corpsman for that. So you have to be in the Navy. So I started looking into the Navy. I think I typed I typed in online. I was like, I typed in Navy and then like the auto-populated like SEALs. And I've heard of SEALs, but I didn't know what they were. And I was like, well, let's look at all the options and make sure. And then I clicked the, I clicked the button and it took me right to the SEAL SWIC website. And I remember seeing all these like videos and pic- I just like do- dove deep on the website because they had like a guy jumping out of a plane. I was like, whoa, whoa, these people jump out of planes and they're in the Navy. This is wild. So I like kept going down. I was like, oh, that's cool. I was like, they're shooting guns and moving around like the land warfare aspect. I was like, that seems like what Marines do too. So I was like, okay. And my like 13 14 year old brain is like telling me all this and then uh i said what what website was this on <laughs> the seal swick uh website uh, seal swick.com oh <laughs> that sounds really familiar doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> absolutely shameless plug okay sorry <laughs> go ahead with your story please so uh i i as i was like diving deep in the website i was like i just kind of was like i think i can do this so i was like this is i think i can do it I want to do it and I sat on it for like a while and I think every day I think I thought about it every day for like a year and then every day every day after that I was like I can't wait to do it so when I was 14 uh, after seeing the website I was like all right yeah this is cool I, I'm, I'm getting in and that's what I want to do oh also my deciding factor for it was I saw you could be a medic within the seal so like you could be a seal and then you could be a, be a medic so that crossed off my boxes and I was like sign me up I'm, I'm in so I looked at what it what it took to be a seal uh, like what the criteria was and you could be 17 if you wanted to as long as the parents signed you and you passed the PST mm-hmm. and I was like cool what's the pst and and it was the 500 yard swim the push-ups sit-ups pull-ups and that run so i was like cool if this is what i gotta do to be a seal let me just get really good at these things so um i i felt like they had it i think the tests is like on there like how they run the test so i was like okay um let me just run myself through the tests and then keep doing that until I get better at them and use the PST calculator. Yeah. So like once I like every time I did it, I like, I saw that they had this PST calculator. So I threw my, all my numbers on there and it like compared my results to people who had already taken the test or people that were already going through training and it would like rank you out on that. And then, so I was like, okay, I'm, I better be in like the, the the top like 10 like eventually like that that was the goal for me and i don't remember what i started out with and i don't remember what i ended with but i I remember just like okay let me just like keep doing this until it's like acceptable and it was super super cool i was like i was like dang i'm like i was like i can compete with some of the people that are going through buds right now and i was like that that was just a cool thing for me I, i thought it was awesome so it was like tangible and like i could see the results that i was putting in and i was getting closer to my goal so uh it didn't seem so impossible to me yeah what what part of the country were you in at the time philadelphia okay and then you you got hooked up with an nsw mentor or a recruiter or how did that whole accession part yeah so when i when i was 17 hit up a recruiter and i told him i "I want to be a seal don't want to be anything else and he's like, okay, cool. Um, take the PST. And then once I took the PST with a mentor out there, his name is Chief Black. Uh, he might still be a mentor out there. Um, and I took the PST through him. The first one I took, I ended up getting picked up on. And then I had my contract going like right away. I was a senior in high school. And then by the time when I graduated, I would just leave for boot camp like a month after that. Mm-hmm. Training for the PST, that's got to be that's got to be tough. I mean, sure, it sounds easy. You've got uh, push-ups, you got sit-ups, you got pull-ups, which are not easy for everybody. You got the run. Some people have a problem with that. What about the swim? Swim's 
Are you a swimmer? So uh, at fourteen, yeah. So at fourteen, I had like no formal swimming training, like other than just like learning how to do it in a pool. So when I decided I want to be a seal, I was like, well. I don't know what the side stroke is and I don't know how to be fast at it. So let me join my like swim team and just get really good at swimming. Cause I'm probably going to need that. <laughs> and, uh, once I did that, I got a lot better at swimming and my times for the PSTs, uh, went way down which like down and is a good thing in swimming so <laughs> it went way down so my times were, were doing a lot better and then i kind of supplemented that training with just doing push-ups pull-ups and sit-ups on my own and running on my own a lot i kind of ran to like a lot of different practices and at the same time i i did jujitsu because i was like well i gotta learn how to fight if i'm gonna be uh, seals so I was like let me learn how to swim let me learn how to fight and then I'll supplement the rest I'll figure out where it goes swim training so you got on the swim team but they don't do the combat side stroke on the swim team so how did you learn the combat side stroke so yeah so they do freestyle uh and then we do all the strokes but I was primarily a brush stroker which is probably the most translatable to side stroke and then I just asked my coach I was like how do I do this like how's the thing and they actually like taught me how to do it and then I did a lot of research on my own like looking at like there was I think there was some videos on the seal swick page that actually had like how to do the combat side stroke so I like did those or I looked at those and I was like all right let me let me try to do these and if I couldn't figure it out I just showed it to my coach I was like how do I do how do I do that like I don't really know so they, they helped me figure it out and it was it was awesome it was uh, on a side note swimming is something I highly recommend people doing not just because like it's a good skill to have it is hard it is not easy and prior to buds like I kind of think it gives you like a, a good edge on being like very being trying to be as comfortable as you can being super uncomfortable which is the water yeah mm -hmm. well it's probably a whole different thing to do the side stroke in a pool and then do it out there in the ocean surf right it's completely different yeah like it's <laughs> wild like i remember like doing i was like yeah once i like got like did the pst's i was like doing well like, this is he, he's like how does anyone feel this and i did in the ocean i was like i'm like swimming in like zigzags because like you, you're not really you have to like look up and guide you don't have a line on the bottom to like show you where to go so you're just kind of like it's it's actually a lot harder than you think on the ocean so yeah not to mention salt water and current and cold it's and freezing all of it. Too. <laughs> yeah. The Pacific is cold. People yeah. don't realize that. San Diego seems like a like you're like oh it's in San Diego it's gonna be really nice. I had I, since I moved back out here I I don't think I've been in the water since because <laughs> I'm scarred. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that's great. Um, so you were able to pick up those skills by looking at a resource on some website called SealSwick.com. <laughs> Go figure. Um, and, and you didn't have a problem with the run? No, um, I, I just ended up, I think I was, I played soccer my whole life. So I, I was always running. So mm. I was, I just never like really timed myself, uh, until I got serious about training. I think I just kind of looked at like different regimens on like how to get good, which I actually, I think was again on the, on the website, it either gave you some, it gave you resources to go like, look at like, Hey, if you want to get good at running or like want to figure out a plan, like maybe look at some of these videos or maybe look into this person. And then as I did my own research outside of that too, I was like, okay there's running programs that can get you here or and especially yeah. i think now there's a lot of books out for like buds training in specific mm -hmm. so that's awesome i'm glad glad those things are out there so you got through boot camp mm -hmm. you went to prep school yes sir yeah in great lakes yep and then came down here to buds what was that that first buds experience like for you it was it was really cool i uh i started with class 311 and uh I remember the, like, just, like, <laughs> the the last class I went through, they went through, like, in the winter time. So, I guess it was, like, almost, I guess, around, like, December time frame. And I went through in, like, the February for, like, Hell Week. And I remember just, we, we heard all the horror stories. Everyone's, like, they got, like, decimated. A lot of people got sick. A lot of people got rolled. A lot of people got dropped. A lot of people quit. And everyone's, like, the mass hysteria was starting to build. And you're, like, oh, God, like... <laughs> why are they all quitting? Like, why is it that bad? Like, holy cow. And then you finally get the buds and 
I'm like, if it's that, like, it's just a PST, right? Like, I mean, didn't people practice this before they went? I was like, isn't that like the whole, I was so, I was so, I've seen like the Buds documentaries that they did boats and logs, but like, and like the surf torture, but I didn't realize like that was the thing that like, that's what made people quit. And in those videos, they don't really show like how much you do them. <laughs> so I was like, I'm like, it's just the PST is the hard part. As long as I pass out, I'm good. And then I got here and people were like, no, dude, it's boats and logs. I was like, what do you mean? I don't mean do that like a couple times. They're like, dude, the whole time. I was like, <laughs> oh, dang, that's good. That's not going to be that cool. Um, so I was like, well, we're here now. We might as well just do it. So it was such a cool experience, but it was really hard. And being I was the youngest kid in my class, me and a couple other guys were like seven, uh, 18 when we actually came to Buds. Um, so it was cool to like have like the younger crew because everyone's always counting you out as like the young guy. Mm. Um, so it, it was for me, it was almost like you always had a chip on your shoulder. Being a young guy, you were like, I'm I'm not no one's going to be right that I quit. Like no one's going to be like, oh, he we expected him to quit. I was never going to let I was never going to fulfill someone's prophecy like that. Like for me, it was going to be like. I'm, just, I'm getting through. I said since I was 14, I'm going to get through. I'm doing it right now. So it for me, it was kind of, it was really, really hard. Every single day was, it was the hardest thing I've Did ever Did you ever have that moment of clarity where you kind of like, uh, were like, wow, did I do the right thing here? After Hell Week. Yeah. After Hell Week is when I like, uh, I was like, because you're so driven and you're like just thinking of like one evolution at a time one evolution at a time and then like you get through how weak and then you're like like it's just such an intense experience like mm -hmm. it's very it's traumatic almost and you, you're kind of like at the end of it you're like did i did i do the right thing? <laughs> did i put myself through like all this all this stuff years of my in my mind of like training for this and do like is it worth it was it worth it and like obviously there's that times like is it worth it and you have to sit there and think about it and that question got answered for me just every day i was like after hell week like it was like cool yeah this is this is still worth it to me this is still worth it to me get through got through sqt went to the medic school I was able to get through that. I was like, this is worth it. I'm, I'm hitting the, hitting the goal. got to the platoon. We, we did the workup. We did everything. And once you're at the platoon and you do your workup, it's just like, it, it is the coolest thing ever. Like it was, it was every, it was like, dude, I'm doing the cool, I'm doing the things in the video I saw. I was like, this is so cool. Of it. So it was worth it. There was that mental clarity. It was like, I, I hope this was worth it. I put my body through a lot and I can definitely attest that it, that it is. Yeah. Were you on West Coast team or East Coast team? I was East Coast team. So I did uh, two deployments over at four and I did both of them to Europe. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. um, let me backtrack a little bit to the special operations tactical medic train because we do have a lot of guys who are interested in see who, who thought the same thing as you. Yeah, I'd like to be a SEAL and I'd like to be a medic. Is there such an animal? Yes, there is. Oh, yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, when I, at the end of SQT, you're, you're kind of sorting out orders and uh, they're like always slotting to get medics. So you, if you desire to be a medic, you put in for it in like your dream sheet and you're like, I want to do it. So right after SQT is when they would send you to the medic school. So they wouldn't, so like, most guys go straight to their team and then they get their schools after that medics different because it's such a long school mm. and at the time of me going through we were still sending seals over to the uh the army course so special operations combat medics course over in fort bragg so i spent like we spent like 10 months to a year with the army out there and that was a really cool course but uh a lot of my friends that i joined uh, that we did like the medic course with they ended up whenever they took shore duties they came and since the navy start like the nsw stood up their own uh medical course so it's called uh sod m so a lot of the guys that i went through in the army course they're over there standing up that schoolhouse and like teaching it and they've really revamped the curriculum like a lot i think at a time it's a lot shorter right it's a lot shorter but it's also um like the quality didn't go away. I think when they initially made the course, it was like, it was kind of like, is it gonna be as good? Like that's always like, the, they don't want the quality sur surrender, right. but they also want it faster. So I think in the beginning in its growing stages, it was like the quality wasn't like, wasn't what they wanted. But 
as like as it's just evolved that course it, it's just gotten so much better and, and it's on par with what the army have if not better like is i think they make quality medics faster tell me a little bit about that that sodom course like if i wanted to be the medic what exactly does that mean what am i going to do what am i going to learn to do in the sodom course yeah so um this is actually really cool it's like such a really cool thing to talk about because it's you are learning to be that guy that like when things are at like the heightened stress period like not even just like just the op like when things are going really really wrong on the operation like they're expecting you to know and save your buddy and it's going to be your friend like you've worked with this guy or probably it might be people you're working with or been working with a couple months so to be the medic you're they're constantly stressing that throughout the training is like hey get all this right because this is going to be somebody you know sometimes like so don't overlook it um and they give you this realistic feel of like being able to like train in real life uh like not real life scenarios but like this they make the scenarios very realistic so that way you get the most out of the training and by the end of it you feel you feel like you can definitely help your buddy like you feel super confident that you can do it whereas like when you first start like when when you first start the training they're like you're gonna have to save your buddy and you're like i don't know anything i, I don't count on me yet like pretty much and by the end of it you're like yeah absolutely i, I feel very confident that i can do that so we're probably not talking about open heart surgery but mm -hmm. no triage no. medicine absolutely yeah so right. uh as far as what medics are concerned it's like I, I think the best comparison is a, pa a paramedic with just a little bit broader scope of practice for the skills. Um, meaning like, okay, they initially, somebody gets hit um, and you have to triage the patient. So you have to A, win the firefight. Then you have to get your buddy out of there. Then you have to stop whatever is happening. Like whether that's a massive hemorrhage, whether that's an airway obstruction, and then run through your entire algorithm that, that they run you extensively through. And from there, you're just, each patient's so different. So you're constantly like always trying to level that person up to get them to a higher, higher level of care. So um, it's like you kind of just said, like it's triaging, like, okay, if we have multiple of these people, who needs to go first if there's only a limited amount of assets? Right. So you take care of the immediate problem. Mm -hmm. uh, stop the bleeding, for instance. Sucking chest wound, whatever. Yeah. Um, get them stabilized. And then ready for to evac. Correct. That's yep. pretty much it. Right? Yeah, exactly. And that, that's actually, and that sounds really simple. It's not. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's such a long process. And it's it's yeah. pretty hairy. You know, you're under fire or you got, you know, adrenaline rush, the whole thing. Um, but that is the difference between life and death i think for most of the if, for guys who have been hit pretty hard mm -hmm. that, that can mean all the difference right oh absolutely yeah it's uh it, that pre-hospital care and all the doctors in the hospital really harp on it and that's why you see a lot of the hospitals like being so invested in the pre-hospital setting so because a lot of like that initial like how the patient's going to do later really depends on how like how they are re responding like in the beginning or how they're being treated in the beginning too like if you give them a treatment that's a not like warranted you could hurt this patient even more more and cause more of a problem so it's that that pre-hospital care is just so important so you got a couple of really exciting aspects to your seal training you've gone through the whole pipeline here at center the, the training pathway for seals buds that's quite an experience all by itself in sqt and then you have the tactical medicine training. So you checked off the, the original block right there about being a, a medic, yeah. combat medic. Mm -hmm. Then you're assigned to a team. You got your, your pumps out to the theater. You come back and then you got into ATC for combatives training, for combatives instructor. How did that happen? So... Um while I was over at uh, Team 4, we have kind of like different phases of the cycle, but one of those phases is uh, professional development. Just means like they send you to schools that will, as an individual operator, will enhance your abilities as an operator. So one of those schools is a uh, combatives instructor course, which uh, I have always done martial arts since I was 14. Um, so 
when I like had an I had like the opportunity to go to this course. Um, it was a month long out here in San Diego, and it was just all the all the things I was already doing on my as my hobby. Uh, just for work for a month so I got to come out here and once I completed the course I was like the combatives instructor uh, for my platoon now we get that question a lot from people um, do you get to pick those schools or does the team pick them for you there's a it's a little bit of both so uh, as like when you're new into the platoon you you're always putting like even as like an older guy you're, you're still always going to be putting like your your dream like your wish list down you're like hey i would let's say let's say it was being a sniper like i as a new guy i want to be a sniper okay okay cool you, that's a very big qualification that has a lot of responsibility maybe maybe the chief is probably going to reserve that spot for a, a, someone with more experience but here's some other courses we have like specific requirements for each platoon that need to be filled let's go ahead and like hey you take these courses and if you take like if you if you're the guy that when you come to the platoon you're like hey i'll do whatever course you need me to do uh i'd prefer if if it was something that got me towards being the the sniper that i want to be or being the breacher being the medic if it was courses that could get me there that would be awesome but ultimately like i'm here for the platoon like that that's what every chief in oic and everyone in their platoon wants to hear especially from a new guy yeah be be a teammate that's really what it is yeah so like it's a little bit of both like you can request and sometimes your request will get filled but there are other schools that are like hey we gotta send somebody to this yeah You're like, all right cool i'm i'm there you need there. a comms guy Ex exactly yeah <laughs> you're the guy <laughs> most most people aren't really wanting to go to comms right away but then they're like all right well we need somebody to do it and you're like okay cool well, i'll yeah. do it, do it. leads yeah. to jtac and who knows exactly yeah yeah <laughs> so let's go back to uh the nitty-gritty stuff here the mma so you got into professional mma mm -hmm. where you're actually part of a part of a circuit yes mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit more about that so once I got to be a combatives instructor out here, I started doing some amateur fights in the in the area. So I was fighting for one of the local promotions around here, uh, just trying to get my experience together. And I was competing a lot in uh, nogi grappling, which is just pretty much submission wrestling. Hmm. Uh, so I was staying pretty active on the scene with all of that. And then a European promotion that decided to set, like pretty much set their roots in uh america for like the first time set it in san diego and fortunate for me that was right around when i was going uh, when i wanted to go pro and when i was kind of done being being in the amateur circuit so the organization is called cage warriors if you've heard of conor mcgregor it's the yeah. it's the league he came out of to before he went to the ufc so it's a very well established league and every conor mcgregor is the most famous for that but like there's been tons of fighters that go into the ufc after this one it's been uh, back in June, I was supposed to make like my professional debut on there. The la like the last couple days, my opponent ended up having to pull out due to like an illness, so I had to wait till September to do that. And then I had my first fight in December, like professional fight in December. I ended up winning uh, by TKO in the second round. Wow! Mm -hmm. And so the next one's right here on the. Uh Right here on the horizon, probably by the time folks hear this, it'll be over. Yeah. Uh, but that'll be match number two professionally two for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then kind of moving forward from there. Somebody might ask, well, how do you do this and do a Navy SEAL career at the same time? It has to be out of short command to have that to have the, the the dedication to do to be a professional in a sport but also to be a professional in your job. Um, you you have you have to be in a spot where you you like I, what, what I mean is like you don't have if I'm in a platoon I wouldn't be able to do this because right. I would need to be there for the platoon and it wouldn't be fair for them if I was fighting and it's and that that's really ultimately what you need to be so being at combatives where I can go teach the skills that I'm learning uh, allows me like the training schedule that I, I can get to train to be a professional fighter to answer your question shortly it's without the Navy has this supportive of it and it's been the fact that they're so supportive is why I'm able to do these things. And uh, I'm just super grateful for it, too. I would suspect the Navy sees that they might be getting something out of that, too, because of the experience of your, you know, matches in MMA. There's 
techniques perhaps that you can bring over to the curriculum and add to that yeah and you know and that's like that's kind of how i like that's how i think of it too and uh that's how i hope that everyone sees it especially as like the rotation of commands come i i hope that's how they see it um it always like sometimes feels guilty because it's like my, this is like the thing I love doing. I love I, I love fighting and I love being a SEAL. So it was like, I got to be at a job where I could do both of those things. So for me, it just kind of like, uh, it's always like a little bit of like a guilty feeling. I'm like, I'm doing like, I'm doing the things I love. Like this is, <laughs> it's really not, it doesn't feel like a job to me, so. So what's next up for you? I mean, we know you have this match coming up in a couple of days, but the outlook beyond that. As far as MMA or career wise? Both. Cool. As a SEAL and as an MMA fighter, what what's next? Yeah, so um, I'm I'm extremely fortunate that the Navy allows me to like fight, and I, I'm I'm actually about to move over to the outreach program, from being combatives instructor to the outreach program out here, and and they're gonna I'm gonna we're gonna go to local tournaments or tournaments around the country too, and I'll be competing at them, um, and whenever wherever I'm fighting, we'll be able to do the outreach there, so that's awesome. And then as far as my career for nogi grappling and mma goes uh i'm looking to to just try to break through on the adcc circuit and essentially that's like the olympics for like grap uh for like jujitsu on like the private side it's not really like it's kind of hard to describe but that's the easiest comparison i can give to people you have to qualify for the tournament through trials and then once you win the trials you go to the tournament and you have to try to win the tournament so for it's grap- like the kumite right <laughs> kind of <laughs> um but yeah so that that's called uh adcc and then so I'm, I'm looking to to win that and make a name for myself in the grappling field and then for mma the goal is for me to i want to make it to the ufc and i, I want to like win a championship there as well um, wow yeah and where are you at in your seal career now so right now i'm currently about nine and a half years in and now since i've been at combatus for a couple of years now and since uh, just because of the way the rotation has to work uh, i'm just going to come over here and do the rotation and then by the time i'm done with the outreach i'll either transition to the reserves or if if fighting's continually going the way at like in an upward trajectory but if it's not or i decide that fighting's not just not what i want to do anymore like as far as like a profession then back to a platoon for me um yeah. th- that that's ultimately because this I think either way, when I'm done fighting, whether I'm a little older or not, I'll probably be going back to the platoon just because, I mean, they've given me this opportunity to, to, to see out a dream, not really having to do with the military and kind of working with me to figure out like how we can work with each other to make it work. So, I mean, I'm just super grateful for it and I definitely don't take for granted. And uh, I don't want to like misspeak or misrepresent a community um, by saying like, oh yeah, like war is all about X, Y, and Z. I've only done non-combat deployments. I got a chance to learn and teach about war and do my fundamental form of warfare in the cage. But after that, all that's done, probably back back to the platoons for me. Yeah, oh, and most people don't know that we have two reserve SEAL teams. Oh yeah, that's uh, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. Um, we don't advertise it a lot, and it's not something you can get to as a non-SEAL. Like Correct. You, you got to be an active duty SEAL first, do your time, then you can elect to go into a reserve SEAL team, but you can't be a reservist first and then try to lad over into a reserve SEAL team. You got to come here, you got to go through the buds, you got to do active tours, and then after that you have the opportunity and and you found out about that yeah. as an option when yeah, you're active duty. Which is awesome, yeah, like because it because I think a lot of guys, uh, myself included, like. It, this is something you've spent a good deal of your life doing and it, and it's kind of hard to walk away like e- even if you're like good job teed up and like you're good you've done everything great in your career you've always i think everyone you talk to just they still have like that hesitancy of walking away from something they've done most of their lives like i grew up in the teams of 27 now i joined when i was 17 so my entire adult life has really been this so I think personally for me, and I, th- I think a lot of other guys may feel this way, is like having the reserves as an option to be able to just keep my foot in the door and affiliated to the community in some way or form, like still allows you to breeze a little like, all right, I can go chase like some ambitions in the in the real world. Um, and then, hey, if I want to come back to the military side, I have my foot in the door where I can go back if I want to or just do my one, my one weekend a month. Yeah, they 
they call those guys up all the time. Like all the time, yeah. There's always a, a reserve augment going out with the teams uh, where there might be a shortfall or something, and so those guys those guys still get plenty of opportunities to go deploy if they want to. Yeah. And if you were, let's say, let's say you were getting ready to get out, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the reserves, um, the reserve SEAL teams just to keep my foot in. Yeah. Um, what would your day job be? Fighting for me. But, uh, yeah, I would try to keep my career as fighting, but also um, just because the skills I can I have developed in the military, um, it could kind of it could go just a bunch of different ways, like with with, hey, maybe we figure out a way to get combatives out to some of these local law enforcement uh, areas like local police departments, maybe Border Patrol, SWAT, uh, whoever, whatever Homeland Security entity would like training like maybe it's a that could be a good way of getting getting your foot in the door that way and i for me it's combatives that's just kind of i think that's just where my life has always been and always will be but like i think for any of the other seals it's like that aren't super super into combatives like there's a ton of things in our job that translate into like the law enforcement sector where like you can either be a law enforcement officer or you can go ahead and help them train for their things too. Well, you've been in for 10 years so you've seen some guys get out what kind of jobs are they getting uh, so some people are doing things like that a lot of guys that i have known have gotten their mbas and are off into some really high-end business jobs uh, and they're doing very successful for themselves so that's kind of a lot of jobs like that um, and honestly it, it's kind of hard because you can kind of do whatever you want like um, I think a lot of people a lot of businesses outside of like a lot of businesses when like you're transitioning out are very excited to get a seal because I think they know what they're getting they're getting someone that works really hard someone who's very dedicated to what they want to do and that can work in a team-based environment so uh, for businesses like that's easy for them and also like leadership positions too that's like if they need a manager they probably know that they can fast track that seal like soon after whatever grad school they do or whatever undergrad they do into whatever business field that they want to so the world's kind of their oyster you know it's it's kind of great i have i have some i have a friend that's he's he's a seal right now he's gonna go put in for his officer package he wants to go be a fighter pilot in the navy like he's wow. gonna go do some crazy things i'm <laughs> like so the world's your oyster like that's a completely different route he's staying in the military but he could do something similar on the private sector for that too so yeah um but yeah, that, there's just so many cool things that I've I've just seen, like the creativity of a lot of people like doing jobs. And also some people are just content to chill. Like they've done, so, for me, I've only done 10 years. Some of these guys have done 20 years and like, they're like, I'm cool, I'm good. Uh, I don't need to, like they can retire. Now they can like have like, what like some passive income coming through and maybe they get a job that that that's just something that just brings extra money into and they, they get to enjoy their families a little bit more too yeah i think that about covers it for today i we got to run along, run along we're starting to run out of time here yeah bobby winther mma fighter navy seal appreciate you being on the show today cool thank you for having me i appreciate it and this was the only easy day was yesterday i'm scott williams until the next time in Hell Week, gents. If you've been skating through Buzz so far, you will not do so any longer.